This is Peter Ferguson again. Welcome back to our third session in our study, our careful study, of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now last week we read chapter one, and the week before actually, uh, where God in Christ had acted, says Paul, to draw together a single but diverse family for himself as a sign to the world that he is at work restoring harmony in his creation. Uh, this work of salvation began when Christ destroyed the cultural and ethnic wall of separation between Israel and the rest of the world. Now he did this to create a new humanity that shows ahead of time and in the middle of history the final destination or the final destiny when believers will live under the reign of God in perfect harmony with God, with each other, and with nature itself. Then, and only then, will the effects of Adam's disharmonious sin be completely overturned forever. Now, I think a logical question rises here. How was the world able to see the community of reconciled people? We need to visualize how homes were built in the first century in order to answer this question. You see, the early Christians worshipped in homes of more wealthy believers. Their homes were built so that passers-by could see actually what was happening as the diverse community broke bread and worshipped the one true God, Yahweh. I'm quite sure that onlookers would have been astonished to see the poor teaching the rich and the rich teaching the poor as they shared their resources generously. Additionally, they would observe men and women worshiping together as equals. Jews and Gentiles would also be talking and teaching one another. Roman citizens, upon seeing this, would observe a totally counterculture expression of community that became the church's principal strategy for evangelism. In short, the church offered a reconciled community united by faith in Israel's Lord and Messiah. This way of living drew people to Christ even more than verbal witness because what they witnessed was astonishing and remarkable, unheard of. Alan Cryer is an early church historian, and according to him, uh, the membership, a membership to a person was granted after and only after a substantial period of teaching. New members were expected to demonstrate that they lived in line with what they believed. Members, in other words, had to walk the talk as a prerequisite for their membership. There were no passengers, no fringe members in the early church, no Sunday-only members looking for high culture and the affirmation, perhaps, that they were in good shape before God as long as they came to church every week. Now John gives us a picture of this new 
and future reality in Revelation 2, 22, 1 to 5. He writes that the reconciled community will become a permanent reality for those who have embraced Christ as Lord and King. Here's John's text. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great st street of the city. On each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamb or the light of the sun, for God, the Lord God, will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So our next step is to read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And Paul says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner, of Christ, of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. The mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And he goes on, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for past ages was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now you notice that in the first 10 verses of this chapter, Paul reminds the Gentiles of the, the seriousness of their former condition and the fact that they had been rescued by God when they were far away, dead in trespasses and sin. The notion that mankind can save itself is nowhere to be found in Paul's letters. The tyranny of sin is more potent than the human will. Sin cannot be defeated by the human will, for, as Paul previously wrote, the will seeks only what the world offers. Furthermore, the unaided will, because of the fall, has no desire for God. Now here's a question I considered. Why did Paul decide to emphasize the fallenness of non-Israel? Did he think that non-Jews were more sinful than Israel? What problem or danger was he addressing or anticipating? in the first 10 verses of chapter 2. Now here I offer at least a reasonable answer. 
Paul does not answer this question in the letter, this letter, but I argue that there is at least a hint of the potential problem that Paul does mention in Romans 11. So let's just stop for a minute and look, uh, take a little time to examine this one small portion of Romans 11. Now, by the way, several scholars, good scholars, have suggested that these three chapters in Romans 9, 10, and 11 were written by Paul as a separate document and then inserted by somebody into his longest letter. Now, I do not agree with this assertion, and here are the reasons. We know that Gentile people accepted Jesus as the world's Messiah more readily and in greater numbers than did Israel. For this reason, Paul was concerned that some Gentiles might, as it were, look down their noses at Jews because of Israel's greater reluctance to believe the gospel claim that Jesus was, in fact, their long-awaited Messiah. However, the fact that the Messiah of Israel was crucified for them an enormous stumbling block. They did not conceive of their Messiah dying on a cross of shame. For them, a dead Messiah was no Messiah at all. Read Luke 24, interesting passage about this. Paul was worried, you see, that Gentile notions of superiority over Jews might cause division between the two groups that God had already reconciled through Christ. Such conceit, anyone can see, could fragment this community along ethnic lines. Jews going one way, non-Jews another. Now here's what it says in Romans 11, verse 25. It's very clear. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in, in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. So I am convinced that Paul in Ephesians 2 was in addressing the danger of Gentile conceit by reminding them that they, as well as Israel, were rescued by God when they were in Adam, in sin, tyrannized by sin, as much as Israel. They were saved in the very same way by faith in Christ alone, apart from works of the law and therefore without merit. Now let's go back to chapter 2 of Ephesians. This passage consists of two parts. Now, in the first part, the human condition is described by focusing only on Gentiles. And the second clarifies God's gracious response to them, that is, Gentiles. Notice Paul's unequivocal description of the human condition. It's very negative. What he wrote does not go over well in Western culture where human progress is expected. But the human race, writes Paul, is dead in transgressions and sin. He has already described sinful humanity as followers of the world, and he insists that all of humanity is in rebellion against God both Jews and Gentiles. Notice this, Paul does not write in ethical terms. Paul describes a state of spiritual deadness and hopelessness in which there is no knowledge, no saving knowledge whatsoever of God. Even more, humanity has no desire for God, not at all. 
those who follow the world, writes Paul, are informed by what human culture defines as desirable and of ultimate importance without any longing for a higher transcendent meaning or purpose. Our culture, modernity, lives without a vertical reverent, referent so that God is irrelevant even if he exists. The only satisfaction sought is the one driven by the natural cravings of sinful desire. Verse 3. Now when we hear language such as this, we are immediately drawn to an image of some incredibly gross sin according to human standards. But I say, I argue that this is not what Paul necessarily has in mind. So let's pause for a minute and ask this question. What does Paul mean by sin? We need to go back to Genesis 3. The serpent, you remember, met Eve in the garden. And he asked, did God really say, you must not eat fruit from the trees in the garden? Two trees in the garden. God explained that there was only one tree in the middle of the garden whose fruit they were forbidden to pick. Now, you know the rest of the conversation. Eventually, Adam and Eve gave in to the serpent's invitation to become knowers of good and evil. They took the forbidden fruit and set the pattern for all of humanity. Adam and Eve decided to be the definers of their own existence and the determiners of their own future by becoming their own God. Not satisfied to enjoy God as created, they preferred to be creator instead. We call this the fall of humanity, and it is the problem God solved and is solving, solving through Christ. So when Paul says that mankind follows the cravings of sinful desire, he is referring to our desire to place ourselves at the center of life where only God belongs. Morality as well as immorality can be equally be occasions for rebellion against God. The person of high moral standard is equally distant from God as the immoral person because each lives according to their own norms. Both are idolatrous. The highly moral may think of themselves as meritorious, while the immoral may conclude that they are beyond God's rescue. The moral, therefore, need grace just as much as the immoral. Both are like the prodigal son. The secular culture often argues that a person does not have to be religious to be moral. Now, I agree that being a sinner does not mean that one is, by human standards, immoral all the time and in every way. Several years ago, I had the good fortune to work with a principal whose strength of character lit up the room. Everyone wanted to work in his school because he had so many Christian virtues, kindness in excess, humility, empathy, much more. When he retired, hundreds came to his party. Everyone loved this man because he was simply a wonderful human being. I gave his retirement speech and extolled his high character. During a conversation before his retirement, he told me gently and kindly that he had no time for religion and that he did not believe in God. Even though God had gifted him with great gifts, 
He was living independently of him. He, but the principle, had taken the place in his life that ought to be God's. You see, the problem was not that he was immoral. He certainly wasn't. It was that he was godless and unable to see himself from God's perspective. This, I think, is what the apostle was talking about. Now, I love C.S. Lewis's illustration, wherein he shows life seen from a human perspective and life seen from a gospel or divine perspective. Now, the essay is called Miserable Sinners. In his essay, Miserable Sinners, Lewis describes a conversation he had with a friend who told him that he could not say the Ang Anglican Confession. He was unable to call himself a miserable sinner, as the Confession requires. He was required by the Confession to describe himself, as I said, as a miserable sinner. He told Lewis that he simply did not see himself as either miserable or sinful. Lewis answered him with the following illustration. He describes two trains hurtling towards each other on the same track at breakneck speed. Each, uh, each passenger was expecting to arrive at their destination. The passengers comfortably reading their newspapers were unaware of the destruction that waited them. Given their limited perspective, they had no way of realizing what was ahead of them. But an observer looking down from a high hill easily saw what would surely happen unless there was a powerful intervention. The gospel is that perspective, and the gospel is that intervention. The only way by which we can see the truth of Paul's description of humankind is to see ourselves from a higher perspective, the, perspe the perspective provided by the gospel. Now back to chapter 2. Paul brings the first section of the passage by saying, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. The word wrath in the second part of verse 3 really grates and irritates our secular contemporaries because it recall, recalls an image of a person whose anger overwhelms them like a tsunami, smashing everything that gets in its way. Complete intolerance. That's what wrath means to a, to a human person. We cannot imagine a God of love acting in this way. So we need to ask what God is angry about. To what is his wrath directed? We find an answer in John's gospel in verse 11. Sorry, chapter 11. 17 to 33. It's a very familiar story. It goes like this. And we are finding out what wrath means. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with hair. So the sister sent back a word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciple, let's go back to Judea. Judea. Lazarus had been dead three days now. But Rabbi, they said, 
a short while ago, the Jews were tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, and for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Now, asleep means dead. It's a, a, a Jewish expression. But I am going there to wake him up, bring him back to life. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered her, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had seen Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, noticing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. The Greek word used by John to describe the intensity of Jesus' reaction to Mary's grief is a Greek word that was usually used to describe the snort of an angry horse. When used of people, it means to express extreme in indignation and rebuke. It is the same word used in Mark 14 when the woman is rebuked for pouring the perfume on Jesus' head. That was Mary we just read about. John tells us that Jesus' tears were accompanied by an outburst of real anger as he approached Lazarus' grave. He couldn't have been angry at what he'd been called to do. He couldn't have been angry that he was called to Lazarus. And he couldn't have been angry at the deep grief of the mourners. It is difficult, impossible, to imagine that Jesus would direct anger or wrath towards Mary and Martha at the time of their tremendous loss. Their brother had died and Jesus was not there. If Jesus is not angry at these things, then what's he angry about? In Mary's grief, he sees and feels the misery of the whole human race and burns with rage against the oppressor of men. It is death that is the object of his wrath, and behind death, there is the power of death, and whom he had come into the world to destroy. Here, Jesus is expressing the same emotion he felt, well, 
I just lost it. Okay, um, let's start there again. Here, Jesus is expressing the same emotion he felt when he overturned the tables in the temple. Things were not as God intended, and to him, this was an outrage that called for decisive action. Death was his enemy. He was angry at death. When Paul says, therefore, that we are objects of God's wrath, he's referring to an anger rooted in his divine love. Wrath is what compels God to act. He's angry at death and angry at sin. Both have caused humankind to move in the wrong direction and take charge of their own life. That is the reason for his wrath. Sin is the destroyer of authentic human life desired by God before creation. Notice that Paul devotes 90 words to describe the problem, but he lingers far longer over the solution. To this, he gives 130 words. His great love, rich in mercy, grace, incomparable riches, his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus, the gift of God. The culminating verse is the eighth verse where we come to the very heart of the gospel. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That verse says, this is a huge text in Paul, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from ourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now in that verse, Paul did not use the word justification, but he certainly has it in mind because that's what he wrote to the church in Rome. In Romans 5, Paul wrote, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now we're talking about the word justification. Now here is one way to understand this word, the met a metaphor of justification. Now, once again, Paul has reached into the Gentile world for a word to explain God's accomplishment in the death of his son. Justification was a legal term borrowed from the Roman justice system, and it pictures men and women standing before the judgment throne of God. All the evidence has been gathered and presented to the court. It's an open and shut case. There is no basis on which to pronounce the accused person innocent. But then the judge says that despite the evidence, the accused is free to leave the court as an innocent person because someone else has paid the price for his guilt. The guilty one is treated as if they are innocent. That is the meaning of Christ's death on the cross. He bears our guilt and his righteousness is laid upon us. In some mysterious way, God, by means of the in incarnation, absorbs into himself the consequences of our sin and by that, he assuages his wrath. This is pure gift to us without merit by the grace of God. Another illustration of justification is found in Luke's gospel, where he tells the story of the prodigal son. The son, as you know, asks for his inheritance, wishing to denounce any claims his father has on him. He's determined to travel in his own direction. He leaves town, relishing the opportunity to do so, to do as he likes. His life eventually becomes a disaster. 
So his only option is to return home with the expectation that he will be treated as less than a hired hand. He prepares his confession, but before he can give it, the father rushes down the road to meet his son. That's Grace. His arms are wide open. Later, he organized a party to celebrate his son's return. The prodigal is treated as if he had never been away. In the final analysis, that is the meaning of Christ's death on the cross. And it is by faith we say yes to the gift that God presses into our hands. Finally, Paul says that they have been justified for a purpose. And his words speak for themselves. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Even though it is impossible to pile up enough credits to cancel our debts, it does not follow that God is uninterested in holy behavior. This is the very purpose he had in saving us in the first place. Next week, we'll look carefully at verses 11 to 22. In this text, all members of the community are front and center. So I look forward to speaking with you again, and God bless.